the Joe Rogan experience. So I live in Las Vegas, which happens to be a good town to think about why the hell can't we moderate, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, when you live there, you see all kinds of wild stuff, right? But to me, what's always been the strangest has been the slot machines. So you've spent time in Vegas. Yeah. It's like they're in the casinos, obviously, but they're in the gas stations, the grocery stores, the restaurants, the bars, and the airport. And they're not sitting empty. Right. People are playing them around the clock. Yeah. So I'm like, what the hell is up with that? Just plays in your dopamine. Well, and it doesn't make sense because no. everyone knows the house always wins. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's like a, a numbing thing. They just yeah. sit there and press the buttons and press the buttons and press the buttons and hope they make money. Yeah. So I, I decide, all right, like, I'm going to find out how a slot machine works. Why do people get hooked on slot machines? That's the question. And so I go into journalist mode and I start making calls. Now, the first group of people that I call turns out to be a dead end. So who I call are people who are effectively anti-gambling researchers. Okay, So these are researchers who have a very anti-gambling bent. And they tell me all sorts of sort of strange things. They're like, oh, it's because casinos don't have clocks. They're like these myths we've all heard. Casinos don't have clocks. Uh, slot machines only play in the key of C, which relaxes people and relaxes their wallet. Uh, casinos don't have any right angles, and right angles uh, activate the rational part of your brain. And so I go, okay. And then I go to an actual casino, and there's right angles everywhere, <laughs> right? The screens are right angles. Uh, no clocks, but guess who else doesn't have clocks? Like most businesses, right? There's right. not clocks in Costco. Most restaurants. Or, right. Yeah. It's not normal to have clocks. And then for the uh, the audio, the key of C, I call up a slot machine audio composer. Now, this is a real job you can have in Las Vegas, right? And this guy goes, where the hell do you hear that? He's like, I use all keys. So I realized that the problem that I'm encountering is that I have called people who want us to stop gambling. Uh, I need to call people who want us to start gambling, right? I got to follow the money on this. So long story short, I talked to a handful of people in town, and this leads me to uh, this casino on the outside outskirts of Las Vegas. Now, it's brand new. It's cutting edge. But the catch is that it's not open to the public. So this place is basically a living, breathing casino, but it's used entirely for research on human behavior. What? Yeah. So Really? Who yeah. funds that? 73 different companies. So there's wow. gambling companies that are involved, but also a bunch of big tech companies who are on the Fortune 500. So I, I go there, and it's, it's like I said, it's a legit casino. How big is it? It's, um, I would say, I mean, it's not the size of a normal casino, like a sprawling strip one. It's probably about the size of your, everything you have here, maybe a little bigger. But they have hotel rooms. It's like a Walmart. Yeah. That big? Yeah. It's in this big um, office building, basically. Okay. And they're basically looking at how everything that happens in a casino affects human behavior. So uh, how does room design and the technology we're using in rooms affect behavior? How does betting with, say, an AI bot versus an actual human impact betting? Now, when I'm there... I meet with, to bring it back to slot machines, I meet with a guy who designs slot machines. So the reason that these things are so entrancing to people, it tracks back to this uh, behavior loop that I call the scarcity loop. And this is a basically a loop, looping behavior that when people do it, they tend to get hooked on it very easy. So it's got three parts. It's got opportunity, unpredictable rewards, and quick repeatability. So Opportunity, you have an opportunity to get something of value. So in the case of a slot machine, it's money, right? Uh, two, unpredictable rewards. You know you're going to get the thing of value if you continue the behavior, but you don't know when, and you don't know how valuable it's going to be. So with a slot machine game, when those reels are spinning, you could win nothing. You could basically lose your money. You could win a couple dollars, or you could win a life-changing amount of money. There's a fantastic range of things that could happen. And then three, uh, quick repeatability. You can immediately repeat the behavior. So with slot machines, the average player plays about 16 games a minute. And that's different from all other habits. Like most habits, you don't immediately repeat them. Now, the reason that 
people are so interested in this, companies, casinos, is because that this sort of three-part system I just laid out, it can get people to repeat a lot of other behaviors too. So it's in social media, it's in sports gambling, uh, it's in dating apps, even companies uh, like gig work economy companies are using it to get people to work longer hours. It's being leveraged by the financial industry in a lot of personal finance apps, and on and on and on. It's become, uh, it's been embedded in so many of the products, even institutions that influence people's lives because it is so captivating to us. We tend to get hooked on this three-part system. Mm. And so when, when you're talking about like gig economy stuff, like uh, you're talking about like Uber and yeah, th- like things along those lines? driving for Uber. And know. so how, how do they use that? So things like um, unpredictable rewards get put up in front of a driver to get them to drive into an area of town that Uber might want them to be in. There's also... Unpredictable rewards? What do you... Yeah, so like you might get, um, say, oh, if you drive here, like you're whatever, we'll, you, you'll make X amount more money. Oh. Right? And it sort of pops up unpredictably. Oh, so they'll, they'll incentivize you? They, they, they offer you more money to go to a different part of town? Yeah, or dropping in cues that's saying like, hey, this is where we are, you're going to make more money today type of thing. Oh. Um, if you think about it in terms of something like social media, it's like the opportunity is to get, say, status or likes or whatever it is, right? And then, say, a person posts, and then the rewards become totally unpredictable, right? You might get two likes, which is like, oh, that wasn't great. Or you might get hundreds of likes, which is like, oh, my God, Mm. that's amazing. It's the same exact architecture as a slot machine. And then you check and recheck. You're repeating the behavior all day. And um, this loop, the reason that we're so attracted to it it goes back to evolution. So I talked to this, uh, once I learned how this kind of loop pulls people in, it's really what slot machines lean on to get people to repeat the behavior. I call up a psychologist. He's this old school dude from the University of Kentucky who's been studying psychology since the late 60s. His name's Thomas Sental. And um, he described, he basically explained, this likely goes back to evolution and finding food. So if you think about hunter-gatherers, the thing you have to do every day is find food. But it's a random, it's random whether you're going to find the food or not. So you go to point A, you don't find any food. Go to point B, you don't find any food. You go to point C, no food. Point D, oh my God, it's a giant berry bush full of food. And that saves your life, right? Mm. So that search, that repeat searching, really pushes us and grabs our attention because it used to help us survive in the past. And there's even, I mean, if you want to get down the rabbit hole in it, there's even um, things like what are called near misses in slot machines, which is when you kind of almost win, right? You might Two lemons. Yeah, two lemons. And the other lemon just barely passes by. Barely passes by. Or losses disguised as wins. Do you know Mm. what those are? No. So that's when, uh, let's say you bet $1 and you quote unquote win. 50 cents. So, oh. right. So you don't lose everything, but you win 50 cents. Now we tend to rea- react to that as if we're winning when they, oh. when they study uh, gamblers. And that's also embedded in the search for food, right? You might, let's say you're hunting, you're like, oh, we got a big kill on our hands. And then you whiff and the animal's on its way. It's like, damn, that is a, that's a, right? That's the near miss. Mm-hmm. Um, or you come up on a berry bush and let's say it took you, you burned 500 calories looking for this thing, and it only contains 200 calories worth of food. Mm. And so all of these sort of evolutionary parts of this system that we used to fall into as we evolved are now in slot machines and in turn now being used by a lot of big tech companies and different industries. Sort so of. they just trick the human reward system. Yeah. Yeah. It mimics these sort of ancient pathways, more or less. And gambling is, to me, is one of the most peculiar ones. Because um, it's so overwhelming for people that are hooked on gambling. It's such a mental health issue. It's such a, an addiction. And when you see people that are just like chasing it and they just can't stop, it's like I always wonder like what pathway is being hijacked? Like what, what is it about human beings that want to risk like literally all of their money on a roll of the dice or on a spin of the roulette wheel or on a hand of cards. Like, what is that? Yeah. 
This is a good question. Now, this this Zental guy that I told you about, he does a lot of research on pigeons. So he can basically turn a pigeon into a degenerate gambler in like two minutes. He'll give a them, pigeon? A pigeon, dude. He'll give them... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said that the same sounds thing. cruel. I said the same thing when I was talking to Isn't him. Isn't life hard enough as a pigeon? Yeah. He uh, So he'll, he'll get pigeons who, you know, they live in these cages, and he'll give them the option to play a game where they every other peck they get, say, 15 units of food. So peck, no food. Peck, 15 units of food. But then they have an option to play a second game. And this second game is very much a gambling game in that they get food about every fifth peck, but it's random. Right, so you could go peck, peck, food, peck, peck. The next one could be food, peck, 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 peck. Right, so it's just kind of like a slot machine. Mm-hmm. And they get more food playing the gambling game. They get 20 units. If you do the math, it makes a lot more sense to play the game where you get every other, right? Every other peck is getting you food. It adds up to a lot more food. But what he finds is that the pigeons consistently play the slot machine game. Ninety-seven percent of pigeons will choose that game. Right, but they're not risking anything. They're not risking anything, right? But it's so how's still, that gambling? They're still putting in the effort to have to play the game. Yeah, but that seems obvious. That, like the the rewards are greater, so they know that if they just keep pecking, it doesn't hurt to peck. They're going to get a bigger supply of food. They don't get a bigger supply though, because they'll get fifteen every other peck, right? Versus twenty every fifth peck. So if you put in a hundred pecks, you're going to get more food playing the one where it's. You get food every other time. Right, but it's still not gambling because the pigeon just sees a larger pile of food with the more pecks. So just wants the larger pile of food. So it just keeps going. It's not like they're risking all their food. Right, right. Um, so I don't think it's a gambling thing. Well, the larger, the larger pile of food comes from the predictable rewards. Yes, right, if you do every other, right? Yeah, every other is how you but, would get the biggest pile of food. But you don't get the biggest pile in one jump, one dump, right? The one where it's every five that's a larger quantity of food. Yeah, so you get 20. Yeah, see, that's not gambling. Why is it not gambling? Because it's just more effort. It's more effort to get a bigger pile. So he would argue that... They're just dumb. They just can't say, oh, it's every other one. Well, all they see is that they're getting, you know, whatever, 15 units versus 20. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Fifteen versus. All they know is 20 units. Like, oh, this one gives 20 units. Just keep pecking. I don't think they're smart enough to figure that out. I think they're just like, keep going. Keep, oh, there's 20. Keep going. Keep going. 20. But there's not a risk. So here's what I'll tell you. He would argue, and a lot of biologists would, they would say, you know, there's this theory called the optimal foraging theory. It says that animals will expend the least amount of energy to get the most amount of food. All right. So over time, they're expending a lot less energy to get more food. And so here's where it gets interesting, though, is that to sort of bring it back to why do people fall into this? Why would someone bet their entire fortune on a roulette wheel or whatever? Is that when he will put pigeons in a sort of wild environment, so where he keeps them is in these pigeon cages where they kind of live alone. It's, you know, it's a basic cage. When he puts them in a cage that mimics the wild, so it's this giant cage that has like roosts, it's got cliffs, it's got other pigeons, it's very much like they would have to live in the wild. And then he throws them back to choose a game. They start choosing the optimal game. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 